Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, I want to thank all of you here for the invitation. Uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, this is a, a historic convention. It's being watched, I'm sure, across this country. But I can tell you from students of uh, democratic constitution making, it's being watched around the world. This is a kind of unique uh, experiment uh, in, in this incredibly important uh, uh, process of democratizing the kind of systems we have in the West. And so this is a very important uh, event, and it's a privilege to be here. You took some considerable chance at inviting a Canadian. You know, a couple of years ago, they recommended in the province I come from, British Columbia, the adoption of a single transferable vote system. And immediately the cry went up, well, that was far too complicated. No Canadian could ever possibly understand STV or could ever possibly make it work. Uh, so to, invi uh, to invite someone from that kind of place to come and talk to you does seem to me a bit uh, courageous. As the chairman said, it was a kind of shock for me to realize that I first came and observed the Irish election in 1973, and I have hanging on my wall uh, a picture uh, that was taken in Dunleary Town Hall at the count, and on one side of me are a couple of pretty classic-looking Fianna Fáil tallymen. On the other side of me, right beside me, is a, a man whose name will be familiar, Liam Cosgrave. And we are all kind of standing watching, watching the count go on. And I have this picture in my office. Uh, and uh, David Farrell walked into my office eight or nine years ago, and he looked up and said, oh, there's a picture of Liam Cosgrave on your wall. He said, who are those other people in the picture? I said, David, that was me as a student. You don't recognize me. I was a little younger and looking, had a little bit more hair. Um, and I'm not sure to this day he believes me that uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was me. But I, I, I learned watching that election there was a good deal to be learned about the, uh, the workings of democratic politics in this world, in this country, and it's a place that's continued to fascinate me. But I, and I want to make a few observations that I've been asked to, to, to make, but I want to start by making two points that seem to me important. Uh, and the first is that this convention really is part of a long history of the Irish people in deciding their own electoral system. 1937, they voted for it in the Constitution. Then on a day in 1959, they voted to retain it. Uh, on the very day they elected Mr. De Valera the president for the first time, and De Valera was going around the country saying, let's get rid of this system. The Irish people elected him, but they didn't take his advice. They said, no, this is our system, and this is what we want to do with it. Then again, about 10 years later, 1968, they uh, voted on their system. Uh, whatever the nature of the campaigns, there's debates about how informed uh, they were. Uh, it's a heritage, I think, to be admired. There are very few other countries in which the population actually gets to decide the electoral system. Mostly those are things decided by politicians in, in, in parliaments. But this is one of the few places in the world that the people chose and rechose and rechose again uh, their electoral system. So I think what happens here is all the more important because you're part of that extremely important and vital and rich tradition. And it seems to me from listening to the discussion for the last two days that it's really in remarkably good hands. So it's in some sense hard to know what I could add to that. The second observation I would start with, uh, and maybe it's appropriate this time of year, that this isn't a kind of leaving certain math exam kind of problem. The reality is you can't get the answer wrong. And the reason you can't get the answer wrong is because there is no right answer. There is no right electoral system. There's only the system that the Irish people decide and believe is best for them at this time in their uh, development. It's the one that ought to reflect shared values uh, that will produce the kind of politics that will help produce the kind of common public life that people want to share and create together in, in this country. It's no accident that no two countries in the democratic world use exactly the same electoral system. They, systems fall into great families. There are MMP types and there are list types, but no two of those are the same. They all have their own variations, and those variations reflect very much the values and the traditions and the interests uh, of the particular community. And so again, it's essentially up to this convention to choose which one articulates the values that are appropriate uh, for Ireland at this time. Recently in Canada, we had two big assemblies that reviewed electoral systems. Both recommended abandoning first past the post. 
two Canadian provinces. One recommended a single transferable vote system, one recommended an MPP system, because they, in these different provinces, thought those would be most appropriate for those particular political communities. Recently, there was a convention uh, in the Netherlands that said, you know, our system's about right. We don't recommend any changes. You know, there was a little tweaking of the ballot form, but basically, uh, they thought that there wasn't need for change because the system they had continued to reflect the underlying values that they wanted. So the key challenge is really not to worry about the mechanics of a particular electoral system because there is no obvious right kind of electoral system. There is no obvious formula that you can plug in and say, oh, this is what we need. The real question is what are the underlying values that are important that you want to see articulated in the way you do politics together? Um, and it's hard because the values that underlie any electoral system are in, inherently in competition with one another. There's the question of how much choice do voters have on election day when they go into the ballot place? What does the ballot look like? What kind of choices does it offer them? What kind of choices do they want? How proportionality? How important is it that political parties be treated in a proportional way? or in some other kind of way, by some other kind of uh, rule, by a kind of majoritarian rule or a plurality rule. How important is local representation? And that speaks to questions about the constituency map and the size of constituencies. How important is stimulating participation? What kind, some systems may make participation easier, some make it more difficult, or you can modify particular systems to alter that. Um, as Michael Gallagher made the point, I think, yesterday, and made it plain that there are inevitably trade-offs amongst those kinds of things. Uh, and no two individuals are likely to agree on what the best trade-off is. And the real question is not what I think or you think is the most appropriate trade-off, but what do we collectively together think is probably the best trade-off for the community in, in, in the wider sense? Which set of trade-offs is likely to get to an electoral system uh, that will come closest to underlying the kind of electoral politics you want. If proportionality trumps, if party fairness is the most important thing, uh, then your preferred system is not going to be the same as if you think local representation and local accountability of members is the most important thing. Um, that they are simply in conflict. If you want more proportionality, you might have less local representation. If you want more and stronger and particular local representation, you may have to give up some kind of proportionality. So the choices are really about not this system or that system, but trade-offs between the kind of underlying values that are, that are absolutely critical, all of which are important. The problem is you can't have all of them at the same time. New Zealand chose MMP recently, about a decade ago, when it changed the system because they decided that they had to make proportionality far more important compared to the system they had in the past. The Dutch have stayed with uh, their national list system because they preferred and thought it was important to strengthen disciplined national parties that had the same presence in every single part of the, uh, the country, and there would be no variation uh, across the country. British Columbia recommended the adoption of the single transferable vote. 57% of the population voted for it. The rule was that it had to have 60% to change, so it didn't happen. But they chose that because they wanted a system that would give them a different balance of choice of voters and local representation than first past the post gave them. And they thought that would be a better trade-off to meet their, the, the kind of desire they had for local representation and so on. Uh, all, all those in the Netherlands and British Columbia and, and in Holland were good choices. They were good choices because they were choices of systems that reflected the kind of fundamental underlying values that uh, uh, people thought were important uh, to maximize. Uh, trading off values, finding that relevant balance has been difficult because there's very different and quite legitimate interests involved in the trade-off. Voters have a real interest in the process. After all, it's their representatives that are being chosen, their parties that are uh, representing the kinds of worldviews that they want to support. And so what are the voters' interests in those trade-offs? But it's also true that politicians, working politicians, have genuine interests in the electoral system. They, after all, have to make the system work. Um, does the system give them constituencies that are workable? 
that are manageable. You know, we have politicians in the northern part of the province I live in that have constituencies the size of France. They claim it's not workable. Well, we say that, you know, that's, we've made a trade-off that have left some of them with that, and we've had to find other ways to deal with that kind of problem. They're mostly empty. They've got a lot of trees and not very many people. Um, does the system create a context in which there are fair competitive relationships amongst the politicians who are engaging in it? Um, does it treat them all equally, or does it treat them differentially? Should the system treat politicians who work in dense urban areas the same as those who have big, sprawling, rural, remote constituencies? Those are hard questions, but they're legitimate questions, and the, and the politicians are on a daily basis going to make the political system work, and so they have legitimate interests in how the electoral system is structured to kind of serve those kind of interests. Voters have interests, politicians have interests, the political parties have interests. The political parties are the kind of shock absorbers of the system, operating between the state and between citizens, trying to find the, the kind of balance that works there. Um, and so we want to ask, what does the system you choose mean for the political parties? How does it affect their structure and shape and the way they work? Uh, parties have to organize and educate the electorate. They have to find ways to nominate candidates, to run campaigns. And different systems give them different incentives uh, and different imperatives to do those kinds of things. Parties in MMP systems and list systems and STV systems will run very different kind of campaigns because the rules of the contest are different. And if they have to run different kind of campaigns, they're going to have to organize themselves differently. So they have genuine interests in the kind of system, too, and, and, and their structures and their practices are shaped very much by the electoral system. And so we can ask about, while we kind of try and resolve the kind of the tensions amongst the values, do we want political parties that are more democratic or more disciplined, more decentralized or more centralized? Do we want parties that are more ideological and narrow in their appeals, or ones that have broad-based appeals seeking to attract support uh, all across the board. And the electoral system is likely to have a profound impact on those kinds of things, because it's the parties who are working the system and are in the middle. So parties have genuine interests in the kind of system. And of course, parliaments have interests. We want a kind of parliament that reflects uh, a specific conception of what we think the wider political community is. Well, the parliaments are, in some sense, created by the outcomes of uh, electoral contests, and different kind of electoral contests are likely to lead to different kinds of parliaments. David talked about how different systems produce perhaps different outcomes in terms of the representative character of the politicians that are produced. So we've got all these competing values, but then there are these different groups that have interests involved. And so the challenge to think about how the interests of voters and politicians and parties and, and the Doyle can be balanced and structured in terms of these underlying values of choice and proportionality uh, and local representation. And if we can get some kind of clarity on what the values are, how important choice and local representation and proportionality are, and recognize how particular combinations of those are likely to affect the interests of the politicians and the parties and the voters, uh, then we can say, okay, now we have some kind of idea of the way in which we want to go in moving towards making decisions about the system. If, you know, if your clear choice is for one party government and you don't care about proportionality and you want single politicians representing just the constituency and you want very decentralized party organizations and a nasty adversarial parliamentary politics, welcome to Canada and its highly decentralized first-past-the-post system. Uh, and the first-past-the-post system helping to perpetuate that particular mix of politics and the kind of values that it articulates. Um, if you, as I said before, if you want proportionality to Trump, uh, all other considerations in local representation is simply not an issue, don't care about it, uh, then the Netherlands with its highly national list system or Israel with its national list system are, are probably directions in which you want to go. But if some more complicated, sophisticated combination of 
choice and accountability and proportionality is what you need, then a somewhat more complex system like STV or mixed member proportional allows you to find ways to balance those things. They do it in quite different ways with different consequences for voters, what your ballot papers will look like, for the parties that will organize it, for the politicians who have to work it. Um, and so it's simply a matter of trying to think through what, what, what combination of values are critical and how do, you, how do you want them playing out in terms of those uh, uh, interests. This is a kind of final thought. Let me remind you that all electoral systems are both rigid in some sense, and they have basic fundamental structural properties, but a lot of them also have bits of moving parts that can be altered relatively easily. Uh, so the single transferable vote has a pretty clear way of, uh, of choice of where you vote, and uh, the counting rules are more or less clear. But constituency boundaries and constituency size is quite flexible and can be manipulated. And you know, one thinks of the Tully Mander and all these kind of episodes in Irish history and similar exercises in other countries and where that happens. Um, mixed member system has other kinds of moving parts and different parts of it are likely to be manipulable, but again, by politicians. And so you might want to think again in making these choices, what kind of system do you want in terms of the balance between its kind of structural rigidity it's structural coherence and a recognition that some parts are going to be flexible and therefore subject to a certain amount of manipulation and change uh, over time by the politicians working the system who have to make it go. And those might be questions about boundaries or quotas or counting processes or ballot forms. Um, so one wants to think about how many moving parts and which are the moving parts in different systems that you kind of care about and that you are prepared to kind of trust to remain moving and which of the parts you don't want to be uh, moving. The truth is, of course, that very few citizens in very many places get to decide on their electoral system. So actually, we, we know almost nothing in political science about what citizens would choose if they got to choose their electoral system. Uh, there's only been two or three exercises in which citizens have actually got to decide that and participate in it. This convention is one of the rare cases where citizens are getting to decide what it is they want. What is the balance of values that Michael and others have talked about? So I think that this country is watching what's going on here. Your fellow citizens are watching because in some sense this convention is a kind of microcosm in its own way of uh, the electorate here. I can tell you that Democrats who are interested in electoral politics around the world are watching what's going on here because this is a case in which, a rare case in which citizens are getting to decide these things. So I just say that I'm, I deeply believe that what's happening here is important. The decisions aren't easy, they're not obvious, but of course we were never promised that democratic citizenship would be easy or obvious. And quite frankly, I envy you the opportunity to be engaged in this kind of exercise. And I thank you for letting me come and watch it.